I please ask all participants to be on mute. May I also please ask all participants except for the presenter and yeah. discussants to deactivate their videos. Please deactivate your videos to allow the meeting to run smoothly. Kindly deactivate videos. And uh, please ensure that you are on mute. Just a few more housekeeping issues before we get started. I see Parker S6 Edge. Please lower your hand. In the next one minute, we shall be starting. Please bear with us. We are just admitting a few more participants. Those that cannot be admitted can also follow this on the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition Facebook page. We are beaming this live on the Crisis in Zimbabwe Facebook page. Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition Facebook page. In the next 30 seconds, we shall be starting. I believe we are ready to start. So let me welcome you participants. Let me welcome you viewers. Let me welcome you those that are also just listening. I welcome you to this public dialogue series hosted by the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, Zimbabwe at 41 public dialogue series. And as, as I say, this is brought to you by the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition. I am your moderator today. My name is Joy Mabenge. I do so many things, but uh, I am here because I am a social and economic justice activist and also a human rights activist. So I'm happy to have been asked, asked by the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition to moderate this conversation. It is a very key conversation, but first things first, who is the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition? So the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition is a coalition of just over 100 Zimbabwean organizations drawn from the labor movement, youth and students, women's movement, informal traders, business member organizations, churches and religious organizations, war veterans farmers' organizations, civil society organizations, human rights defending organizations, law-based organizations, economic justice movement, and many more. And it is important for me to say unto you today that this year, 2021, the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition marks 20 years of contributing to the search for social and economic justice, and of course, the elusive sustainable democracy which is exactly what brings us today to this dialogue which I am facilitating. Now for today's dialogue, we have a panel that is going to be led by Professor Atham Tambara, who is the main panelist, and we have Jana Ngube, who is a discussant, and Amanda Sitlenlov, who is also a discussant. I will introduce these in detail at the point they will be ready to speak. But what brings us today, here today, surely many of you would know that as we are speaking, the upper house was sitting to vote on constitutional amendment number two, which is a raft of changes to the constitution that many of you as Zimbabweans voted yes to. You would recall that in 2013, almost 95% of Zimbabweans who were eligible to vote in the constitutional referendum, voted yes to a new constitution. It was a negotiated constitution by political parties and of course through the parliamentary select committee, the COPAC, which was led by the three representatives from the three main political parties that had uh, 
representatives in, part, in, in parliament then, you would agree with me that the spirit was that spirit of national unity. It was the spirit to actually grow our democracy, to take the country to the next level. That is the spirit within which the constitution was negotiated. And therefore, 95% of Zimbabweans voted yes to that constitution. Today, there is constitution amendment number two of 2019 being pushed through today in 2021. And uh, it has already passed certain stages. And if it passes through the upper house, it, uh, it awaits presidential assent. And it will introduce quite a raft of changes. But the question today is, is that good for democracy? What is happening to our democracy? What is happening to constitutionalism? That is precisely the reason that brings us today here, and uh, we could not be blessed enough by having, of course, one of uh, the former principals to the global political agreement agreeing to grace this occasion as the main speaker, Professor Arthur Gusen Oliver Mtambara, PhD. So many of you know that he was one of the principals to the global political agreement, which did give birth to the GNU which of course also gave birth to the COPAC that drove the process that produced the constitution that is being amended today through parliament. But Professor Atham Tambara is the managing director of Africa Technology and Business Institute, ATBI. He's a professor of operations management at UNISA School of Business Leadership. He's also a former Standard Bank director for payments with responsibilities in 17 African countries. Is a research scientist and professor of robotics and mechatronics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and NASA, with business experience and skills as a management consultant, consultant with McKinsey and Company. He's a professor of business strategy at Kellogg Business School in the USA. So as you can see, he's a well-decorated comrade, and we are very happy to have uh, Professor Atham Tambara have the main goal at the topic for today. So without wasting time, let me hand you over to Professor Arthur G. Om Tambara. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, can you all see my shared screen? You can, you can see my screen, right, Joy? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that detailed uh, introduction. I'll go through a number of slides. If I move too quickly on a slide, don't worry. We can cover the material during discussion. And also, I'll be circulating an article tomorrow which covers what I'm talking about to you. We are talking about Constitution of Zimbabwe, Amendment number two. What are the implications for democracy and constitutionalism? That's what we're discussing today. My screen just frozen. See. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to work on introductions and uh, to say what are we talking about, what is the background to this discussion. Then we'll go through some definitions. Uh, what do we mean by democracy? What do we mean by constitutionalism? Then we'll go into the details of the provisions and then analyze the implications to democracy, analyze the implications to uh, constitutionalism, and then also look at broader implications to the economy, to the image of our country, and then we're going to talk about the way forward, the fight back. How are we going to fight back over this subject? Now, you see, when we talk about amendment number two, it's not just about democracy and constitutionalism. If you do well around democracy, if you do well around constitutionalism, your economy will flourish. You have more jobs, you have more performance of the economy. If you do badly around democracy, if you undermine constitutionalism, you damage the rule of law, you create uncertainty in the economy, there will be no investors. So today we are talking about the economy. We are talking about the economic fortunes of our country by way of analyzing the impact of this amendment to democracy and constitutionalism, we are also discussing the economy. 
you've already been told it was passed on the 20th, 20th of April 2021, and now as we speak, it is being discussed in the Senate. Whether it is passed or not, the discussion that we're carrying out today is very important. Whether, because right now it's going through third, third stage and also the final stage in the Senate, uh, they're going to pass it or not pass it, but it doesn't matter. Whatever happens today, the content of my contribution remains important. Of course, when it is passed, it is going to be signed by the president, it becomes an act. Once it becomes an act, it is going to change the supreme law of the land, which was adopted by 94.5% of 3.3 million people on 16 and 17 March who voted for this, for this constitution. Let us understand the background. Amendment number two is not the first one. There's amendment number one, which was passed illegally in the Senate on 6 April 2021, after the bill had, had, had elapsed, uh, when the parliament had, um, uh, had, had been dissolved. So already we have an illegal act, amendment number one, which has been challenged in the courts. That act is about the appointment of the chief justice, the appointment of the deputy chief justice and the judge president. And these are now being solely appointed by the national president after consultation with the uh, Judiciary Service Commission. No public nominations, no public interviews. Those were removed from the constitution. So number two is a follow up to number one. Number one is already problematic and we're creating another problem. What is number two about? It seeks to change the retiring age of, for judges. It seeks to remove public interviews from the process of uh, hiring judges. Beyond the two, the, the three. Every other judge now, there'll be no interviews. It seeks to remove the, the presidential running mate clause. It seeks to extend the women's quota. It seeks to introduce a youth quota. It seeks to introduce a number, the number of ministers chosen from outside parliament from five to seven. It seeks to vary the devolution clauses. This is amendment number two in a nutshell. Is this good for democracy? Is this good for constitutionalism? Let us explore. Now, when we say democracy, what are we talking about? When we say constitutionalism, what are we talking about? Democracy is a form of government in which the people have unfettered authority to choose those that govern them and those that legislate on their behalf. According to Abraham Lincoln, a government of the people by the people for the people. Also, we can say democracy is the summation of experiences of struggle by the generality of the people as they endeavor to improve their material conditions. What we're doing in amendment number two, is it good for these democratic principles? Does amendment number two advance these democratic aspirations and ambitions? Are the people at the center of amendment number two? Does it promote a government of the people by the people for the people? How is our social and economic welfare as Zimbabweans improved by amendment number two? How does amendment number two improve our economic fortunes? Does amendment number two enhance democracy or is it consolidation of authoritarian rule? What is going on in Zimbabwe in May 2021? Constitutionalism. Now, here we have to be very careful. There are two terms, constitutionalism and constitutionality. Our topic is about constitutionalism. But we also say something about constitutionality. Constitutionality is the quality of being in accordance with the constitution. Are you in abidance to the constitution? Are you in accordance to the constitution? That is constitutionality. Constitutionalism is different, and we'll talk about it and define it. However, we will find that, in fact, in amendment number two, we are violating both constitutionalism and constitutionality. But I want you to understand the distinction. Constitutionality is the quality of being in accordance with the constitution. What is constitutionalism? The three distinct 
but related aspects of constitutionalism. Number one, constitutionalism is the tradition, the culture, the behavior of respecting the constitution. That's the first aspect, the tradition, the culture, the behavior of respecting a constitution. That's number one. It's a value system that is developed over time, measured over time. You can't legislate. It's a very hard notion to have that culture, that tradition, that behavior. That's number one aspect. Number two, constitutionalism is the doctrine of limited government or limited power of the state as opposed to arbitrary powers. We are saying constitutionalism accepts the existence of a government with powers, but it insists on limitations placed on governmental power. Limited government, limited authority of states. That is a second aspect of constitutionalism. The last aspect is constitutionalism is an unequivocal commitment to the declaration of rights. What is called a bill of rights in other jurisdictions strict adherence to functional separation of powers please emphasis on functional don't just have them separate executive legislature judiciary are they functionally separate now when you look at amendment number two the question is are we having strict adherence to the separation of powers is amendment number two respectful of and in compliance with the constitution? Is our behavior showing a culture, a tradition of respecting the constitution? Already, we have an illegal act, act number one, amendment act number one. We're showing a culture of disrespecting the constitution, a culture of not respecting the constitution. Also, we are showing a culture of having no constitutionality. Is amendment number two promotive of limited government? That's what you should ask yourself. Are we limiting governments or are we increasing the powers of the center? We're increasing the powers of the president. Is amendment number two promotive of limited government? That's what you must answer tonight. Does it enhance people's participation in the exercise of state power? We must answer that question. Is amendment number two promotive of the functional separation of powers? These are the questions we must answer today. Okay, now already we know term limits, running mates, and all these things. And already we're saying amendment number one was passed illegally. How did that happen? The bill failed to garner two thirds in the Senate in 2017 and was sent back by the courts, and then was illegally passed in the Senate on the 6th of April, 2021. The bill had lapsed when the eighth parliament was dissolved. So what we've done in Zimbabwe, we've passed a non-existent bill creating a legality. This is a violation of constitutionality. This is a violation of constitutionalism, passing a non-existent bill, creating a legality. This is the culture we don't want in Zimbabwe, the culture of disrespecting the constitution. Running mate. Why did we put the running mate in that document in 2018? To avoid weak and disposable vice presidents. Hmm? The way Robert Mugabe used and abused Joyce Mujuru and dumped her. The way Changirai used and abused Kupe and dumped her. We don't want that. We want, if someone is your vice president, they must be your running mate and they must be clear and well defined succession. This is the motivation behind a running mate. When you have a running mate, the people are involved in succession. The people are involved in voting for your successor. VP becomes an election issue. Why do people oppose the running mates? Because they prefer an unelectable vice president. 
They prefer a weak vice president they can get rid of. They want to have unbridled personal power. They want to manage factions in their own party. They want to undermine their rivals. They want to solely control succession in their party. By the way, not only Zanupiev loves this one, other political parties in Zimbabwe do not want a running mate. They want to be able to control succession. They want to succeed themselves. Let's go back to ZANU-PF. An elected Chiwenga will be a strong arrival. An elected Chiwenga will be guaranteed of succession in ZANU-PF and may be the president of the country. But no, 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 we don't want that. ZANU succession must be left to ED and his clansmen. ZANU succession must be left to ED and his tribesmen. That's why they want to remove the running mate. It's not good for ZANU PF, it's not good for Chwenga, it's not good for the country, it's good for Mnangagwa and his surrogates and his psychophants. That's why we are removing the running mate. Devolution. The starting point, people, is to say, ZANU PF has no commitment to devolution. They've had eight years of lack of implementation. All the clauses in chapter 14, sections 264 to 73, have not seen the light of day. Why would you say ZANU PF is changing the constitution to promote devolution? How can you promote something you don't believe in? How can you promote something you have not implemented in eight years? There are two sources of discomfort in ZANU PF. Number one, they don't want devolution in principle. They don't like it. If this was a one part state in Zimbabwe, there would be no devolution in one part state in Zimbabwe. Number two, they fear opposition control of provincial councils. They fear opposition control of metropolitan councils. That's why they don't want to implement chapter 14. So there's no way that ZANU PF in amendment number two would promote devolution. If ZANU PF hates devolution, why would they have amendments to enhance it? That is illogical. It is pure nonsense. Amendment number 19, number, uh, amendment number two ch changes. They undermine devolution. They create weaker councils and a stronger central government. The objective is to remove MPs to undermine opposition controlled MCs and undermine the stature of and impact of PCs. When they remove MPs from, from provincial councils, when they remove MPs from uh, metropolitan councils, they're undermining the stature and impact of those councils. They're undermining these MCs because most of them will be controlled by the opposition, Harare, Bulawayo, Mutari. So all the changes in Amendment 2 are meant to undermine, not promote devolution. MCs will no longer be chaired by mayors. These mayors are opposition. ZANU does not want them. Election of 10 of the members of the MCs by party list. The party list PR will bring in ZANU PF members into these councils where ZANU PF has zero MPs and zero councillors. It's a clever way of accommodating ZANU PF in the PCs and MCs. So I want to say this very strongly. There is nothing in amendment number two that promotes devolution. You have been hoodwinked, you've been misled, you've been bamboozled. There's nothing in there that promotes devolution. Shame on you, opposition parties who are saying we are voting for devolution. No, you are voting against devolution. Opposition members, parties, they dominate MCs in Blawayo Harare. With amendment number two, ZANU seeks to break this control. Who says parliament must supervise PCs and MCs? I've read somewhere people saying, ah, no, we must remove MPs from councils because parliament is going to supervise the councils. No. The councils must be empowered. The councils must have power. They're not supervised. They must be strong. And mayors must head those councils. So in summary, it is dishonesty and the duplicitous conduct to say amendment number two 
advances devolution. It does the opposite. Women in youth quarters. Oh, we love this. Why are you rushing? The elections are in 2023. Why do you have to vote for the quarters now? Why don't you kill this bill today? And then tomorrow you introduce a clean bill with women and youth quarters fresh without the contamination of the other matters. Why rush? Where's the urgency? Elections are in 2023. Of course, the Junda has a deadline for 15 May 2021. So why are you enabling the ne regime's nefarious agenda? Why are you helping the Junda, the Huda? Term limits are in violation. The changes are in violation of Section 328.7. It's a fatal and incurable illegality. Why? Because a term limit is defined and stipulated by age limits. Once you change the age limit, you change the term limit. Zanu is trying to be clever and half. They're saying, oh, no, we're not changing the term limit. We're changing the age limit. We are not blind, deaf, and dumb. We can see through your scannery. The distinction between a term limit and the age limit is a false distinction. The term limit defines the edge. The term limit is stipulated by edge. So when you change the edge limit, you are changing the term limit, symbol. So when you do that, you are violating the constitution uh, 328. And also you are seeking to make sure the current officers benefit from the change. That's double whammy. That's two strike two strikes against the constitution. Number one, you can't change 328 by parliament. You have to go to a referendum. Number two, you're trying to get the current members of the judiciary benefit from it. Those are two illegalities, incurable illegalities. So what are we saying? No, amendment number two does not further the ambitions of democracy. No, the people are not at the center of this bill or this act. No, amendment number two does not promote a government of the people by the people for the people. In fact, it is government from Nangagwa, by Nangagwa from Nangagwa. Not even the government for Zanfie by Zanfie for Zanfie. No, 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 no. It's Mnangagwa and his psychophants, Mnangagwa and his clansmen, Mnangagwa and his tribesmen, not even Zanfie. So the ZANU people are voting for this thing. They are voting against their own interests. This bill is about government of Munangagwa, by Munangagwa, for Munangagwa. Not ZANU PF, not the people of Zimbabwe. How is the social and economic welfare of Zimbabwe improved? Nothing, nothing at all. We are wasting resources working on these amendments. We are creating uncertainty, we are creating lack of rule of law, we're going to lose investors. So this amendment has nothing to do with democracy. It's an indictment of us all. It's a negation of democracy. Does amendment number two enhance democracy or it, it consolidates authoritarian rule? This is authoritarian consolidation, no enhancement of democracy. The people voted in 2013 95% and of the 3.3 million people who voted. And now ZANU-PF is abusing its two-thirds majority. By the way, even if you have a two-thirds majority, you have a moral obligation not to abuse it. After July 2018, ZANU had a majority. I've seen the numbers now, people saying, no, well, ZANU-PF doesn't have majority, they are four short. This is because of the deaths that have occurred. Yes, 176, four short. Yes, 53 short insanity and uh, one short insanity. Again, they're being enabled by bankrupt opposition MPs and senators who are supporting them. But on their part is ZANU PF. They must not abuse their large numbers. They must not abuse their majority. That's why we must stop them in 2023 from getting a two thirds majority. We'll see when we come up to the recommendations. Okay, we must also remember that we don't only talk law, we must have political and moral arguments against this, this amendment. 
we must make sure we fight the reintroduction of an imperial president. This is what it means, the reintroduction of an imperial president. We are, we are seeing the introduction of a blind, compromised and captured judiciary. There is an effort to create an imperial president where AD and his clansmen slowly, con slowly control and determine succession in Zanapia. Amendment number two is a classic example of unbridled weaponization of the law. It is consolidation of political power and repurposing of institutions towards this goal. Okay? And it is not operating in a vacuum. They also have a, a amendment number one, they have the patriotic view, they have the deployment of unrestrained and naked violent repression, there's the cooptation of the opposition, the bribing of the opposition, there's harassment of the opposition, there's patronage, there's systemic corruption, there's primitive tribalism and shameless clansmanship. This is the package which we're having in Zimbabwe. There's a method to the madness, power retention and consolidation at any cost. We are seeing the creation of the foundation for authoritarian consolidation, angered in despotic power retention, it is a total negation of democracy. Constitutionalism is amendment number two, respectful of, or is it in breach of the constitution? It is in breach. 328 has been breached. It is an incurable breach. Is amendment number two, promotive of limited government? No. It is consolidation of power around the president. We are giving the president more power. We are moving away from constitutionalism, limited governments. Does it enhance the people's participation in the exercise of the powers of the state? No. We are removing power from the provinces, power from the people, and putting it at the center. We are undermining devolution. Is amendment number two promotive of functional separation of powers? No. We are creating a blind and compromised judiciary. We are creating illegal judges. Even if they pass it and Munangagwa signs it, those judges who benefit from those changes will be illegal judges. We are creating a constitutional crisis. We are disrespecting the constitution. We are not following our own constitution. We are having rule by law. What we want is rule of law. What we're doing in Zimbabwe is ruled by law. It is an affront to constitutionalism. Okay, the breach has been explained. We can talk about that in detail, but we've seen the breach already. Can the judges, who are the beneficiaries of the illegality, can they cure the illegality when we go to court against it? Can Turkeys vote for Christmas? Most unlikely. That is why we're calling it fatal and incurable because the very people who are supposed to save us are the beneficiaries of the illegality. And as we have indicated, there's nothing there in terms of devolution. Okay, you can't strengthen something that you have not implemented. And as I said at the beginning, people, we must understand this. Amendment number two is a violation of constitutionality. Amendment number two, is a violation of constitutionalism. We are going for the rule of law, and yet what we're having here is rule by law. So even if they pass it, they are violating both constitutionalism and constitutionality. We want rule of law, not rule by law. Now, as we conclude, let us look at this. We are also damaging the image of the country. We are creating uncertainty. We're showing the lack of rule of law. We're damaging investor confidence. We're doing irreparable damaging to our standing as a nation in the continent, in the region, and globally. We are tarnishing our national brand. We are irrevocably drifting towards a despicable pariah state, devoid of any semblance of the rule of law, thus undermining our efforts at global re-engagement. We can kiss goodbye to our aspirations to rejoin the Commonwealth. There is no place for unprincipled and unimaginative despots in the Commonwealth. No unprincipled and unimaginative despots are allowed in the Commonwealth. We have already damaged our standing with this act, with this amendment, okay? 
ZANU-PF has embarked on a self-inflicted global regime shame, shaming agenda. They are shaming themselves. Let me start by saying this very clearly. I'm opposed to sanctions against Zimbabwe. I want the sanctions against Zimbabwe to be removed. I hope the regime and this unintelligent, pitiful and clumsy apologist hear me loud and clear. Don't get it twisted. I'm opposed to sanctions. I want them removed. However, sadly, Amendment number two constitute self-imposed sanctions against Zimbabwe. By carrying out this act, by carrying out this, this uh, amendment, we are imposing sanctions on Zimbabwe. What are the sanctions? Violation of our constitution, creating illegal judges, driving the country into a constitutional crisis, manufacturing a compromised and planned judiciary, reestablishing a corrupt imperial presidency, angered in tribal and clansmen politics. These are sanctions that Mnangagwa has imposed on Zimbabwe. Shame on you. These are sanctions against our country. But more importantly, these transgressions provide those who've imposed sanctions on Zimbabwe with reasons why they should maintain their measures against us. So what we have done with amendment number two is to give justification for sanctions against Zimbabwe. We've played hostage to fortune. We've enabled our detractors to have justification against us. We've given our opponents a big stick to beat our behind. We are so shameful. We are begging for more sanctions. We are asking for others to punish us by violating our own constitution, creating illegal judges, creating a constitutional crisis, creating a bankrupt imperial presidency. We are inviting sanctions against Zimbabwe. Shame on us. How can we be so destructive as a nation? Is it sheer ignorance of a leadership bereft of statecraft competence? Or is ZANPF just being spiteful? Which is which? In a cynical way, Amendment number two justifies the maintenance of sanctions against Zimbabwe. Is that what you want, ZANU PF? I don't want it. But what you are doing is to create the rationale, to create the justification for more punishment against our country. Shame on you. How do you go around the world asking for sanctions to be removed when you are creating more of the behavior that is that you are being punished for. How dumb can you get? Way forward, we are finishing joy. We are now concluding joy. We are saying we can't take this lying down. There must be broad classes of struggle, strategic counteractions, legal efforts, political maneuvers, and invigorated civil society. A principled and united opposition must drive the fight back. We must fight this. We must support and buttress the legal challenges in the courts against Amendment Number One or fr launch fresh ones. We must launch a legal challenge against Amendment Number Two before the signature or after the signature. If they pass it tomorrow, if they pass it today, we must go to court and charge challenge this thing on the illegalities and. We can do it before the signature of the president or after, it doesn't matter. We must go to court. We must do political mobilization and campaign against amendment number two. We must devise strategies to stop future constitutional changes. By the way, this is just a beginning. These guys will not stop. Next, they are changing the presidential term limits. Next, they are changing the age limits. Next. They are going to violate and change our rights. We must stop them in their tracks. This is just a beginning. The regime will move on to change presidential term limits. They will change the age limits for the president. They will change and violate our rights. We have to fight. We must make amendment number one and two election campaign issues in 2023. Make ZANU-PF pay politically for the amendments. We must campaign in 2023 against ZANU-PF using amendment number one and two as big sticks to beat them up politically. 
all opposition presidential candidates without exception must declare their running mates in 2023. Understand me here, uh, opposition leaders. You must declare your running mates in 2023. Even if there's no law compelling you to do so, you must do so for your credibility. You must do so to justify your opposition to amendment number two. And we know, if you know that it is good for the country to have a running mate, you must walk the talk. Just because there's no law require you to be nice, does not make, it does not make you uh, violate people and be a bad person. You don't need a law to do the right thing. You must declare your running mates. You must walk the talk in 2023. We want a clear United Opposition strategy to stop a zanu pf Putin's majority. People, we must make sure never again do we give zanu pf a Putin's majority. Any party, for that matter, no party should have a Putin's majority. Even if they're short of four, they must be short of 20, short of 30. Don't give them the large numbers they can abuse to change our constitution. So let us have a clear United Opposition strategy to stop ZANU PF from getting a two thirds majority in 2023 and beyond. Opposition parties must stop the misguided, misplaced, and unintelligent concentration and obsession about the presidency at the expense of parliament. Don't just try to win the presidency. Let us win in parliament. There's no point in winning the presidency while losing parliament. There's no point in performing well at the presidential level while giving ZANU PF a two thirds majority. So let us make sure we change our strategy come 2023. There must be deliberate efforts to improve the quality of our presidential candidates, the quality of our parliamentary candidates. Why? We must emphasize on meritocracy. Why? Emphasize on technical competence. Why? Emphasize on proven capabilities. Emphasize on ethical leadership. Emphasize on strategic thinking. Emphasize on a track record of measurable achievement. Let us have high quality presidential candidates, high quality parliamentary candidates. This is the only way we can protect ourselves from a rubber stamp parliament and things like. Um, Amendment number two. As we conclude, let us understand this. Amendment number two is about a violation of democracy. Amendment number two is a violation of constitutionalism. Amendment number two is going to damage our economy. It's going to damage it, our economic fortunes because we're creating uncertainty, we're violating the rule of law, we're damaging our brand. This will affect in our bread and butter situation in the country. This will affect the number of jobs in our country. So it's about the economy. It's about democracy and the economy as well. So with those words, uh, Joy, I wanted to just flesh out the issues so that we can have a discussion on the implications on democracy, constitutionalism, and the economy. But remember, be masters of your own destiny. We can't allow this to happen in our country. We must step up to the plate and fight, and fight to stop the shenanigans of ZANU PF and Emerson Munangagwa. I thank you so very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Atam Tambara. That was a powerful presentation. And uh, I am sure participants were following uh, those that are not admitted into the Please do follow us. We are broadcasting this live on the Facebook page for Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition. So thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Atam Tambara. That was really, really captivating. The connection that you, you made really between constitutionalism, democracy, and the economy, the political economy. And I, I think you are very, very clear about your position. It is unequivocal. We are very clear about... Um, the fact that you do not um, uh, support uh, amendment number two, uh, elements of it, and of course, uh, you know, the, 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 the other aspects around uh, uh, what is being peddled that you think is uh, really not uh, uh, correct, e.g. the fact that the ruling party supports devolution through this amendment. And you're very clear also around what you propose as the way forward. And I will not at this point uh, summarize what you have uh, uh, presented on Professor, just to thank you for now and um, put you on pause as I invite um, 
uh, the, the, the respondents, the two respondents to come in. Now I will start with uh, uh, you, Amanda. Amanda, uh, the amendment does have uh, quite a number of elements. Amanda is, uh, Amanda Sishendlov is a registered legal practitioner of the High Court of Zimbabwe. Since December 2019, she's quite young, she's academically inclined and has obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree with majors in uh, legal theory, English literature and political and international studies. From Rhodes University in South Africa, she followed this up with a bachelor's degree in law from the same university, and she has been practicing law in Blawayo with uh, Mr. Webb Law and Barry with a specialty in commercial litigation matters. And I understand, Amanda, in your, in your other time, you do, um, you are a legal vlogger with a passion for educating the public on day to day legal issues. Now, here we have. Uh, Constitutional Amendment number two, and the professor has laid bare the challenges that we are facing as a nation. For you as a young person, Amanda, in five to eight or 10 minutes, what are your reflections on the professor's presentation? And of course, your own reflections on this uh, amendment. What do you have to say to Zimbabweans and the specific constituencies that you want to speak to? Over to you, Amanda. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for having me here this evening. It's been um, quite an interesting perspective that Professor has shared with us. And I'd like to, to thank you for that, sir. Um, my immediate reflections, even just listening to the presentation and how I've sort of viewed our discourse around issues like this as a nation, is that there seems to be an exclusion of the voice of the ordinary person. One thing that stands out to me um, in terms of my concerns is that is the slow wiping away of the public consultation procedures, meaning when we sit down um, as just ordinary people to think about what are our morals, what are our values, because that's the spirit of or the culture of constitutionalism that Prof was speaking to at the beginning of his presentation. Um, however, these debates then become polarized to the extent that we aren't able to really look at the nuances of what is really going on. What I mean by that is um, I'm very uncomfortable with the wholesale approach to say that the constitution should not be amended absolutely without perhaps considering some of the amendments and thinking about why. Why is this a problem or, or what exactly is the problem that is, is being raised and what should people really be worried about? Um, like was said in my introduction, I do take time to do a lot of work in terms of explaining some of these things to members of the public. My, pic my, my particular focus would be to the youth of our nation, you know, my peers. Just this afternoon, I put this question out on Twitter and just did a, a very casual poll to say that the Constitution Amendment number two, what are your thoughts on it? I didn't get a single response. Um, I also asked, what is it that you would like me to comment on? Um, and the options were, well, I don't care. Or what, what is being changed anyway? One was the option, and the other option was, what can be done about it? the responses are quite low. And my assessment of the situation is that people don't quite understand, first of all, the constitution, and people don't quite understand how these systems work and they're supposed to work, how they're designed to protect us and how they're designed to, to operate. Now in, in constitutionalism, there's a, a phrase that they like to say, to say that a constitution is a living document. That means, um, not to say that it is uh, literally alive and ever changing, but the constitution is drafted in such a way that it encompasses broad principles and broad values such that it can adapt to the changes in society without itself being changed. Constitutionalism, uh, like Prof explained, is it's a mentality, it's an ideology that we all have to understand and buy into for it to work. And for us to understand it and buy into it, we must trust it. And trust comes with stability. 
Now, our constitution in Zimbabwe is very young. Um, by young, I mean literally, it's a 2013 constitution. And in terms of developing the culture of constitutionalism, that's something that has to be done over time, that has to be done consistently, that has to be done transparently so that we can see how these things work, so that we can actually trust it and believe in it and be able to use it. Uh, I would want to make a comparison with the South African constitution, which is uh, since 94, I'm about the same age <laughs> as the South African constitution. And they are not even there yet in terms of the spirit of constitutionalism, although they've gone quite further than us. So what I'm trying to get at is to say at this early stage of the game of us trying to, to adapt to the spirit of constitutionalism, for us starting to understand our part as people, in a nation and how we can influence certain changes, how we have to respond to, to a bill like this, for example, um, coming into play, that understanding of the constitution has to be there. So once we hear of an amendment happening at this stage, to me, I'm a bit concerned because the question is why, why what has occasioned the sudden urgent need for us to, to amend this constitution that is just hasn't even come into full operation. There are certain things that still need to be done for us to even see, is this working for us? Is it not what is occasioning um, a sudden change in the terms of the constitution? Is anything in here that is being changed particularly urgent? Is anything particularly even relevant to the ordinary person sitting at home? Right now we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, economically, everyone in the world is suffering because of the effects of it. And there seems to be just a detraction to, you know, political arguments, which to me, I believe, excludes a lot of people from the debate. Once you come in and say this is a, a ZANU PF move or this is an MTC move, immediately we split the conversation into half. Either you are for or you are against particular parties, particular people. And it stops being about understanding, you know, what is actually happening. So I do like the spirit of saying, let's, let's educate ourselves in terms of what is, what is a constitution and how is it supposed to be changed? Now, the how part of it is what becomes important because I think this is one of the biggest issues. This is one of the biggest things that we must be looking at very carefully to say that, okay, say perhaps there is a need to make these changes. Um, how is this supposed to be done? And why are those mechanisms put into place? So I want to make reference to section 328 and um, perhaps if anybody wants to do further reading an article that was done by Mr. Alex Magaiza on the issue which very nicely unpacks the how part of it to say, well, a constitution is not something that should be able to be changed quite easily. So we have to look at, was this done in a considerate manner, in a manner that considers the procedural aspects to it, which are there to protect the substance of the constitution. Once you have um, an unweighted shift in power, whether it's in terms of the executive, whether it's in terms of the parliament or the judiciary itself, then we have a problem. Like Prof illustrated to say that there are certain pillars that then become affected and then that is what makes it relevant to every single person to sit down and actually look at this conversation and actually think about, well, how does and actually realize that it does actually affect your day-to-day -day life and what are we able to do um, about it. So the voting process is something that Prof hammered a lot on in his, in his presentation afterwards, which I think is, is part of it to say, well, the members of parliament, the people who, who we then appoint to come and sit there are the people who are going to be in the room when certain things are being passed and not passed. Do we know these people? Do we know how the procedures works? And are we as people engaging with these processes to contribute um, to the conversations that are being had? I do feel um, the youth are not participating in these conversations enough. And I think it comes from just a mystification of these things to the extent that people just assume that this is a political things, if I'm not actively involved, if I'm not uh, filling a particular seat, or if I'm not a lawyer for that matter, this is a conversation that doesn't include me. 
Um, so I do think that some of these, um, well, I understand that it's a bit of an academic and complicated issue, but we do need to demystify these things so that we can see where, where we stand, even just on an individual basis, and we can actually then confidently speak on some of these issues so that we can find a way forward as a nation and we determine what, what our values are, because that's what it means to say the constitution is a living document. It's supposed to adapt to the needs of society, not adapt to individualistic needs, not adapt even to party needs. It should respond to some kind of a need within society. So my observation is that I don't, I don't see why this needed to be done right now. Not to say that constitutions don't get amended. Yes, they don't. But it then raises many questions to say that what, what is this, you know, skipping of procedures and um, you know, insistence on immediate change of the constitution this early in its life, what are we trying to achieve and is it serving us as, as people? Um, my conclusion would be to say that I don't, I don't think that in terms of what's actually happening in the nation right now, this is the most um, pressing thing, which I guess is, is why there's so much alarm around it and why we should actually consider it and read, read the actual bill for, for yourself and see what is it saying and what do you believe. Um, I'll give an example of the retirement age of judges. This is a, a, a debatable issue that you can see in many jurisdictions. This is not the first time the question would have come up. Do we want a, an older bench? In some societies, we do believe that the elderly, it comes with experience, it comes with um, wisdom. Some might say, well, no, we want to, we are a young population. Zimbabwe is a mostly youthful population. So what if some would want to say, well, I think that having younger um, judicial members is something that we want to aspire towards. Mm -hmm. But once we close out public conversations, even in the process of appointing judges, then, then we're starting to move away from the people-based approach um, in these conversations. So I, I think that that would be my, my brief observation. But um, overall, I think I have, I've picked up quite a bit from the presentation. So thank you for that. And thank you again for, for having me. Thank you, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, very critical interventions there. And you asked uh, critical questions. You seem also to have this message for the young people. Why don't you seem to care? Why are you not really uh, quite engaged and uh, quite, quite involved? You know, you seem also to have um, uh, very critical questions to the establishment. Why the urgent? Then we become very urgent yeah. in this life of the, the Constitution. Is, is this, are these amendments very key? And is this something that you think uh, would rally the nation towards uh, unity and, of course, the need for coming together? And the question still remains. Does this promote democracy? Does this promote constitutionalism? And of course, does it grow our economy? And um, really thanks a lot uh, once again. Amanda, I know uh, participants here have uh, questions. We note your questions. Please keep them coming in the chat box. We are noting them and we'll come to them. Those that are not able to follow us through the Zoom call, please do go to the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition Facebook page and uh, follow the proceedings there. And before I come to Jana, I just want to also just take the opportunity to acknowledge the leadership of the convening organization led by Rashid Mahia, who is the chairperson and of course led by the executive director, uh, who is also the regional coordinator, Blessing Vava, and your team in Harare, I will not mention names, but this is just to acknowledge you and uh, also on behalf of participants to thank you for creating the platform. Let's keep the comments coming. Now, Jana Nube, um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce you, Jana, and I would love that you come in quickly on this one. So Jana Nube is a policy and development expert who has worked in over 35 countries across Africa and engaged global multilateral institutions on Africa's regional integration, governance, and human rights. So she currently works as an international consultant leading global advocacy campaigns, 
coordinating collective action for the protection of civilians from war. And prior to this, she was the Pan-African Director for Oxfam and also worked with the organizations such as SADC Secretariat, Accord International, the Pan-African Citizen Network, among others. And uh, more importantly, really, back to Zimbabwe. So Jana's uh, involvement in Zimbabwe and contributions on Zimbabwe include, among others, being an active member of the Tokomache-led National Constitutional Assembly, uh, being the chairperson at some point of the Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe and being the vice chairperson of uh, crisis in Zimbabwe coalition at the point it was um, uh, chaired by Professor Raftopoulos. So she has also remained actively engaged on working towards a more democratic Zimbabwe over the years. So Jana, with uh, this uh, illustrious CV and your experience in the in the region, you are a governance expert and you really were also engaged in the nascent stages of, uh, you know, the constitutional reform discourse and activism in Zimbabwe. What are your reflections, number one, on uh, the professor's uh, input and anything that also strikes you on Amanda's input, but more importantly, just your reflections in uh, not more than 10 minutes on this amendment. What is happening to our democracy? What is happening to people? participation in constitutionalism. Over to you, Jana. Thank you, Joy. And thank you to Crisis uh, in Zimbabwe Coalition for this opportunity this evening. I am going to really keep it short, Joy, because I can see the comments in the chat room. People are itching to engage uh, with our illustrious uh, professor, the former deputy prime minister of Zimbabwe. And thank you for those remarks. Joy, I, I, I say Joy loves me. He made sure I didn't come after Arthur because, my goodness, uh, it, it could only take Amanda's clear, youthful, you know, clear, smart thoughts to respond more immediately. So thank you, Joe, for, 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 for that. Um, I, I'm just going to highlight perhaps three or four things uh, uh, in my reflections, both on the amendment itself but also um, on what uh, the prof has said uh, this evening. I'm going to ask the host to please mute because I, I now hear myself shouting, trying to speak over the noises that are coming through. So, so my first one was a reminder by you, Amanda, of myself when I started engaging in politics in Zimbabwe. It was because of the work that was being done by the National Constitutional Assembly where they were mobilizing the nation, including us, the youth. I was maybe a few years younger than you um, at that time uh, in 1998. And I always used to tell people that in that season, all I used to read in the newspaper, I would go and open the cartoon and I would go and read Haga the Horrible at the back. I didn't care about politics until I got connected to the National Constitutional Assembly process because it was pushing for a people-driven constitution. And you are so right that when you start engaging the people, you are educating them and exposing them to issues that are important on their governance and that are important on what happens both to them in the now, but also in their future. That's what attracted me at that point to that debate and to that discourse. And I became a very active member and I remember that what really, in my opinion, birthed the 2013 uh, constitution was not only the negotiations that were done by the political parties. It started back then in the late 90s when we led and engaged as a people across the country to talk about how we wanted to be governed by a constitution that was written by us. And for us, at that moment, we're reflecting on the basis of the mm -hmm. Lancaster House constitution which we felt was just a negotiation uh, by political actors so that, you know, we could uh, get Zimbabwe best uh, at that time. And so this issue that both Prof and yourself, Amanda, implore about the lack of consultation of the people. I mean, to me, this is what drives me, really that breaks my heart, really infuriates me about the politics of our country, is where are the people? Where is 
the centrality of the issues that touch the Zimbabwean today. When you look at the level of indignity our people live with today, why is that not the obsession of politicians? So for me, this amendment, honestly, it feels like the people have lost to politics again. We are letting politics be what imposes how we get governed and how we live again because we are not valuing the people. The reason why 94 plus percent of the voting registered voters back in 2013 voted for this constitution is because of the 14, 15 years of conversation across this country about how we wanted to be governed. I mean, it's, uh, it's not even 10 years. It's not even 10 years. Who would let a seven, eight year baby uh, you say, I want plastic surgery because I now want to change how I look because I don't like how I look. Who would allow that? So it, it, it breaks my heart because I, it, it, you, you then really feel our politics has no respect for the people of this country, yet it purports to represent and wants to advance their interests. It breaks my heart because in 2013, we thought we had arrived at a place where we had shared values. Um, clearly we don't, or at least the people with the power to uh, change our laws don't recognize that and don't see that. Where is the respect for our people? Where is the respect for the choices that we made just not long ago? And, and, and so that's, that's, that's really something that I, I think is important for us to reflect on. The, the second thing is really about, um, you know, back, back, back then when we first um, had a national referendum um, in 2000 on the constitution. One of the reasons is the National Constitutional Assembly at that time, we led a vote no, was because we, we were so unhappy with the process. I, I, I know most of the participants here, Joy, are, are men, but I, I know most men of today are sophisticated. I'm sure, Prof, you bake cakes for your boys at the house. Um, and if, if anybody bakes or cooks and follows a recipe, you know that the process is just as important. If you're not just looking at the outcome, if you mess up the process, the quality of what you produce is equally messed up and poor. And, and that's part of this issue that I think the three of us are so aligned about, Joy, that the lack of consultation, the lack of engagement with the people in itself undermines the outcome of this particular amendment. And then the second thing I wanted to highlight is, is perhaps something I disagree with you on, uh, Prof, um, on the issue around uh, the decentralization amendment. And I want us to reflect on something because I, I feel sometimes as Zimbabweans, and I'm not saying that about you, but I'm just generalizing, yes, that we, because we have been so broken by the way this country is ruled. We have become a broken nation, a broken people, and sometimes our analysis gets mad by those scars that are there due to our brokenness. And, and I feel we end up sometimes, like for me, when I read these amendments, I feel they become reactionary about the political actors and individuals and entities of the day. Yet the constitution ought to be a legacy that outlives everybody who is on this call today for generations in the future. So when I think about some, or when I see some of these amendments um, on especially decentralization, I, I, I'm attracted to some of them. I'm attracted to some of them because I really care about the aspect of accountability. I care about agile, um, bodies at every level. I, I really care. There's something attractive, I think, for me about independent layers of governance. And, and I lived in Kenya for a season. Perhaps my experience of what I saw with the decentralization of Kenya, which was really real, not what we are seeing here in Zimbabwe, although I think we could borrow aspects of it. I actually, for me, do like the idea of having 
people who are elected at local government to be the only ones who are allowed to engage with the local government aspects. I, 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 and those who are elected to engage at national level to be the ones who engage with issues of national level. This, 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 this hybrid of MPs, uh, you know, uh, being also at national level, being also at council level, I, I, I think there's, there's something there that um, I, I think could confuse things, could confuse things about um, on accountability. I, I, I also like the idea of, of people leading our cities, um, our metropolitans, um, uh, our, our, our councils being elected directly by the people. I, 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 I have tended to feel that sometimes what we see in our councils, both rural and urban, regardless whether it's an MDC or ZANU PF, a leadership, they tend to also not prioritize what the people of that place are really needing prioritized. They prioritize their party agendas. And living in Bulawayo, uh, Amanda can, can share with you as well. We've seen a lot of things happen in our local uh, council. So, so there's something there. So for me, the point is there's a danger that amendments and our own reactions to the amendments are colored by our perception of either ZANU-PF or MDC. And so, Prof, perhaps you are right that, oh, these amendments are being opposed to want to manage uh, MDC-led councils. And perhaps that's what the drafters of this uh, think. But our own analysis also ought to go beyond ZANU-PF and MDC, because to be quite honest, in my opinion, ZANU PF is not forever and certainly not in its current version and in the way it works. Something is going to give somewhere along the way. I, I mean, opposition politics has also shown us that MDC wasn't, for, wasn't forever. <laughs> so, 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 so I think there's a danger in making reactions or amendments on the basis of current institutions that could change tomorrow, that could split tomorrow. So could we look at the amendments um, for what they could be? And I know it's dangerous in this country, right? It's dangerous uh, because the motives of our political actors have continued to show that we can't trust them. But I thought I would throw it in there to say, can we look and learn from other countries that have done this and pick what could be good for us? And I know time has gone, Joy. Allow me to throw in one more, one more comment and one more reflection. And this one is, a, is one I felt also a bit divided on. Because um, in one way, I feel like there's some things that are being given by one hand. And, and as a woman, I wear makeup. You know, I put on mascara. I put on, you know, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. I put on lipstick. I put on foundation and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but that stuff is not always real. Um, when I go to bed, <laughs> uh, it goes away because you wash your face so that your face breathes. Um, so on one hand, I feel there are some things that have been put on there to make it look attractive. But on another, I think the prop has done a good job to show how our democracy and our governance values are being chipped away. So yes, of course, I celebrate the gender quotas and uh, their extension because the two, two, two terms of parliament was just not enough to inculcate a, a politics in our political parties that actually enables women to fairly rise uh, to the top. I, I, I support the specific inclusion of people living with disabilities. I support the inclusion and the provisions being made for the young people. Um, uh, although I don't agree with them that they should be 50% uh, uh, leaders uh, as some of the commentary by the young people I, I have seen. So, so there are those things. I actually also, I'm attracted to, the, to, 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 to like the idea of seven ministers appointed by a president, especially because our constitution limits our executive to only come from parliament. And all of us have kind of seen, right, the caliber of our parliamentarians is it, sometimes quite troubling. So the idea of going out into the marketplace to look for qualified individuals with the competencies in certain areas to run those areas, it's very attractive to me, Jana, it's very attractive. Um, but of course, I, I think what we don't have 
are political entities and political parties that we can trust with power. And this is what we are seeing with this amendment, that ZANU-PF gets two-thirds majority in parliament. What does it do with that power? It abuses that power to fast track a process that it should take with seriousness and weightiness to engage us. So will President Nangwagwa use the power that he wants to give himself here through his political party to appoint ministers that are truly technocrats that will actually deliver for the people? So that's the question. So we are talking about issues of trust. We are not trusting the intention. We are not trusting the process. Therefore, it means this, this, this cake it is not going to come out right. Um, and so, Joy, I, I will leave it there and sure. engage uh, with the questions. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jana, for the illuminating input. And of course, you know, just taking us back a little bit to uh, the times of the Votno campaign in 2000. And uh, well, you also talking about uh, how process is as important as the out output itself. So really, I, I also think you bring in a dimension where you are also saying that the amendment is not bad in totality. In its totality, there are good elements there, as you did say, like uh, the provisions for the extension of the women's quota, the inclusion of uh, people with disability and the youth quota. And I think Professor did um, uh, pose a question where he also said, why not just pluck out these good amendments and not dilute them with other uh, issues and uh, chain them out there and push them through. We still have a bit of time. Now, uh, the time most of us have been waiting for is upon us. We have had our three uh, speakers come through, the professor uh, and uh, the two uh, women here, Jana and Amanda, coming in with their thoughts as well. And uh, we see your comments are keeping on coming in the chat box. Now, rules of engagement here are that if you want to make a contribution, you are going to have to figure out how to raise your hand and uh, the facilitator will acknowledge you and give you an opportunity to speak. I will also allow my co-hosts to assist me in, in case I am not seeing some of um, the things happening with the screen here. Now, we, we do have... Um, other people that, that are logged on to this um, uh, activity and event. And I think it's important for me just to acknowledge here that uh, the very first and uh, founding director and at some point executive chair of the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, Brian Tamuka Kagoro is uh, following proceedings, so he's participating. Uh, he is also logged on to this uh, Zoom call. I must also recognize uh, uh, a few other colleagues like uh, Dr. Pilani Zamchia, who has also uh, led crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, both in South Africa and in, um, in, in Zimbabwe. We have Machova Nanube. We also have George Makoni, Ernest Moyo, uh, Kenneth Mandaza, and a good number of uh, you colleagues. So at the moment, I do recognize that Dr. Pilani Zamchia, you have your hand up. Let me recognize you and straight away allow you to come in with your quick input or question. Over to you, Doc. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. I think uh, we have been treated to some kind of uh, Silicon Valley of, of analysis from Prof. Jana and Amanda. Uh, I really appreciate the presenters. There's one thing that I see missing. I don't know uh, what the prof and others have to say. The context of these constitutional amendments. I think uh, if we miss the context, uh, we might miss as well uh, the practical resolutions. The context is a military coup that happened in November 2017. So most of the ills that we are seeing in the Zimbabwean society today, I would argue, is about trying to give painkillers to that military coup. That, that's why you would see all, all these communal ethnic ties to try and coup proof uh, even the mil military along its hierarchy. So even the constitutional amendments are also partly to try and coup proof. But in other regimes where there have been military coups, uh, this has not 
actually provided a durable solution to society. So I think Zimbabwe still needs to confront one of the greatest issues on the political table. That is how do you cure that military coup? Because you might even have a recurrent of that. So I see the context is starting on the amendments. I would like us to stretch a bit further and even go you know, further historically. And then uh, this one is uh, just a friendly question. I'm mindful of time uh, to Professor Atam Tambara. Uh, I heard you very well, and I like your fight back strategy. And I would like to say I've known you as a frontline soldier. And when you say we, uh, do you mean uh, you are coming back now to be a frontline soldier and uh, fight these uh, ills dominating our society? I believe you have nothing more to prove at the global stage, unlike some of us, uh, but at home. Otherwise, Jana and I. Amanda, uh, thanks for your feedback. I agree that the Constitution is a living document, but let's always think that uh, when you need to amend the Constitution, the idea should be about to deepen democracy and not to consolidate authoritarianism. And definitely what we are seeing here, no smokes and mirrors, it's about you know, deepening authoritarianism rather than deepening democracy. So if we made a distinction along that without wearing political part lens, I think we'll arrive more or less at the same conclusion with Professor Atam Tambara, though he was a little bit more into party politics as a frontline soldier. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much there, Doc, especially the, the point you, you raise around the context. Uh, it is about proofing. It is about correcting or writing the coup. And um, very important point there, I'm sure the uh, panel have taken note. I note here we have uh, hands raised by Sakile S.N. Londo Zindlovu, Samantha Nenkomasha, and Yangason Matete in that order. Please okay, yeah. ask him your question. Yeah. Oh, really? Identify yourself first. And ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, Everybody else, please mute. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Felani. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me after Doc Zamchia. Uh, I just thank you so much, Saki. I wanted to appreciate the presentations and the discussions thus far, but I wanted to throw a reminder into the room and also to throw in a word of caution. I think the first one is I want to remind uh, Zimbabweans as we talk about this issue that as Zimbabweans, we never agreed to be ruled we have always asked to be governed. And so even the language of ruling party versus governing party, uh, we agreed and I think it's important um, to, remind, to, con to consider that when we look at the constitutional amendments. My second point is to say that in the constitution of 2013, we did attempt significantly as citizens to stop political parties outsourcing their poor political accountability and poor political problems to the country. And with, with, the, with the amendment that is currently on the table, we are going back again to absorbing the problems of political parties into the country problems. And that should stop so that regardless of what political party takes over the leadership within the governance space, it does not subject us to the problems that it faces internally. And that's a reminder and a word of caution I want to continue to throw into the room. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakile. In fact, I, I had not uh, recognized that it's you because of the way your name appears though, there. So also to recognize you, Sakile, and say Sakile has also been mm -hmm. one of the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition. Thank you so much. Done. Next is um, London's in love. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Please go on, Londo, unmute and make your quick contribution. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Mlondo Rosendovo. I'm a journalist and media researcher. So uh, my question is related to uh, the issue of the gap that has been left by um, the disbandment of the NCA um, when it was reduced into a political party. So my question to the professor would be, uh, to what extent has civil society tried and create 
uh, something that can actually replace the National Constitutional Assembly so that it can raise consciousness among the citizens so that these debates can not only be on Zoom and they cannot only be in these spaces where only uh, elites are found. Then uh, the other question is related to the need for the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition and other civil society organizations to avoid having us speaking alone. I mean, uh, there are people that defend the, the, the amendment. I think it's such a platform we would have loved to hear from them, why is it that they defend such amendments and why is it that they have chosen to, to stand uh, by such a position? Then lastly, um, it will be a message to the civil society to say that, uh, do you think the civil society has done enough given uh, the fact that they have supported these, uh, what others have called a, co a flawed document that has been pruned to amendments time and again? So um, has civil society really done enough to actually stop such things from happening, or we've only been uh, people that are short-sighted in as far as planning is concerned. So that is my submission. Thank you so much, um, Londolozi, and my apologies for the earlier pronunciation. Let's quickly move on to Samantha. Samantha Ningomasha, your quick contribution, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll be very brief about this. I have a few concerns. The first one is on the use of jargon. When we talk about things such as constitutionalism, democracy, you know, it's all words, but what does it mean in action, especially for us Zimbabweans in a country whereby if you step outside, you are going to be in trial, in and out of prison over a year, especially also for the young women that are taking these platforms, regardless of them being politically affiliated, but what what does it mean for us young people to be able to step out and to take charge and to be able to claim all of these uh, instruments that are already available that have been mentioned? We need to be constitutional, we have this. And um, the second part is maybe um, addressed to, I'm forgetting your name, was it Amanda? Um, and it's specifically on uh, just to add to say, I don't think young people are not informed, or they're not interested, but what power do we have here? We can have a whole tweet chat and enjoy talking about it, but if it's not going to bring results then. And also for yourself, what are you doing to encourage young people to really take part in these conversations? Because it's one point for you to be educated and to be informed and to want to talk about a subject that young people are uncomfortable discussing because we actually don't see the results. And from experience in Zimbabwe, Trukuroa, uh, what does it mean for young people exactly to be able to claim these instruments? Thank you so much. Before I go to the next uh, person on this first round, just to note one of the questions here is from uh, Faro Q Tendai Toto. The amendments have issues with me if no wider consultations were made since the constitution was made by the people and for the people, I would assume the citizens are more relevant to any significant amendments to the constitutional provisions or clauses, etc. It appears to me uh, his address is really like uh, talk campaigning for opposition forces against ZANU PF. I'm prepared to hear more about democracy and how it is uh, trodden by amendments. Is there no legal way to test the jurisprudential and constitutionality of amendments? at the concord, irrespective of their harsh misgivings and mistrust against the judiciary. There must be creative litigation to adhere to constitutional and judicial processes available in our constitution and legal jurisprudence. That one is for you, um, Professor Mtambara from Faro Q Tendai Toto. We will be reading some of your comments and your questions here as uh, the discussion goes, we still have about an hour to 7.30. The next one to give an input was Young Asun Matete. Please, Young Asun, in less than a minute, let's hear, let's have what you, let's hear what you have to say. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, it's unfortunate that I've only been awarded uh, less than a minute to present my, my thought. Uh, today is a very sad day for me personally because uh, uh, the question I made be number two is something that I have stood against uh, with some of my colleagues. Uh, we tried to engage government, we tried to engage parliament, but uh, they responded by arresting us 
while we were trying to present our own side of the story, that why we are against the constitutional amendment number two. Uh, but like uh, the other, like Mlondolos was saying, maybe we as civil society, we are trying to, uh, to, 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 to explain the, to the citizen of, of Zimbabwe where they are located in all, those issue, in all these issues. Where someone who's selling bananas at Copacabana is, how is that person going to be affected by the constitutional amendment number two? So we have left this battle as an elite thing, not something that involves all the people of Zimbabwe. So that's where the challenge is. So we don't have the buy-in of course, but because they don't understand what you are, what you are even talking about. Uh, what what where are they located in the where are they located in the constitutional amendment number two? Where their lives are? Because people are now fighting about lives, life laws. They are not in, uh, concerned about democracy and constitutionalism. They are concerned about their lives, where their lives are located. Uh, number two, my question, my my, my question goes to Jana. Uh, she talks about. She says she uh, she agrees with the extension of the, the of the women's quota. I don't think I believe that the women's quota is there to uh, to, to to enhance gender equality. For me, I think that the women extension of the women's quota serves to entrench patriarchy, because it portrays women as lesser beings who cannot uh, contest against their, their male counterparts and win. It tokenizes women. Already, the constitution of Zimbabwe is, is yet provisions that ensures a gender equality. We don't need the, the extension of the women's quota. The women's quota, as it is now, it also doesn't speak. Uh, uh, it also excludes women, women who are outside political parties. What are women who are also in civil society, who are also in, in churches? Where are they located in this extension of the women's quota? Thank you. We so only have. Paul? May I pause Thank you. There? I believe you have made your contribution. Let's allow. <laughs> Um, Thank you. And that, that's a question. The question is directed to you, John. I'm sure you have taken note of the question. And of course, there is an opinion that is shared there by Young Asson. Just to also remind you, the participants, that for crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, the responsibility is to convene, the responsibility is to allow voices to be heard. And none of uh, the views uh, uh, suggested here and shared represent the official view of uh, crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, except where this has been uh, communicated by the leadership. So it's for you to participate. I will take two more inputs before we go to uh, the panel for, for, for responses. I recognize you, Manyara Muyenziwa. Please unmute and go ahead and make your quick contribution. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak um, on your panel. Um, and I can just about uh, sense the, um, the need for change, uh, you know, from everyone, but not knowing exactly, you know, what direction, you know, to take. Um, and as well, what direction to take without the proper knowledge of what you're asking for to be implemented, you know, for you to understand um, and see the fruition of uh, all these um, uh, issues uh, that are being um, uh, uh, voiced out um, uh, here. So I think the, 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 the first thing I need to, to, to say is um, uh, the issue with Zimbabwe is that you have in an, uh, a government of anarchy. So as long as a government of anarchy is in place, all these things that we're voicing out will never be uh, fruitious. Uh, in the sense that, you know, we are voicing out democracy and yet our government is an authoritarian government uh, that is quite autocratic uh, from the very beginning. And, um, and, and uh, I think we had a second extension with uh, Munangagwa. Uh, you know, I think everybody, I did see everyone, um, by the way, I'm, I'm just talking from the UK. Uh, I did see everybody, I think, um, um, lining up and uh, coming up together uh, in a very uh, calm protest, uh, you know, when uh, I remember Mugabe, you know, was uh, removed from power and uh, people actually thought, you know, this is the change that they were looking for and that this is the change uh, that could replace uh, the, the former regime that was there by not knowing that inadvertently they are reinstating the same regime that they wanted to topple. So with that, you know, as ourselves, it's, it's an issue uh, within uh, ourselves as citizens, you know, that um, we were given the first warnings 
we could see the issues of the first regime. But what did we do? We went on to reinstate the same regime. And now we are sitting here crying wolf. But okay, then what can we do, you know, from there? What can we make um, as changes that can allow our voices, you know, to be heard? Like what, you know, Professor, you know, Atham Tambara was saying, we've got to fight not just with our voices, you know, talking on this platform, but actually looking into these procedural changes and actually see the legalities of them and how they can be implemented, not just by the voice, but on paper, pushing uh, forthright, you know, for these issues to be put in place. I can just quote, you know, what's uh, something that, um, you know, uh, Thomas, you know, Jefferson said. Yes, please, please conclude then. Yes, yeah. What he said, you know, was uh, some men look at uh, constitutions with uh, sanctimonious um, uh, reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Confident, co Covenants, too scared to be touched. And they ascribe to, to, to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. So what you're finding is um, we do have an interchangeable relationship you know, within the hierarchy itself, if you can just allow me more time to speak, please. No, 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 I won't uh, allow you. I'm sorry, Manya, <laughs> I won't allow you. Just, uh, I'm sure you have met your point. And uh, if I allow you, we will defeat the purpose of the conversation to admit a little more people. So I believe I've given you enough um, uh, airplay already. If you can just conclude in 30 seconds, please. Or I, you are on mute if you are concluding. the procedural changes that we need to put in place, um, are looking at the, the referendum itself, you know, how can we push for a referendum to be put in place so that, you know, with any legality changes that are to be seen in any constitution, us as the people, we should voice our thoughts. We should mm -hmm. be heard, you know, in a procedural form that is there, that is mandated, and that is right. allowed you know, for every citizen to be heard because what you, what you see in a constitution is that it is from the people. It is for the people. It is the voice of the people. That's sure. what makes up the constitution. So with it. Thank you so much, Manyara. Um, we had your point and a key question there around um, the referendum. Uh, the last person I wanted to invite to make an input before the panel comes through is Dr. Mararike. But before you do that, Dr. Mararike, just to uh, recognize one of the questions here from or contributions from David Matumbike. While I am against Constitutional Amendment Bill number two, why do we need MPs at provincial level that balloons the size of government and overburdens the taxpayer? Each provincial council will end up with an average of 50 members giving a total of approximately 500 officials drawing from the taxpayer isn't enough to justify, uh, to, to just have elected councillors irrespective of which political parties they come from. That is David Matumbike. Thank you so much for that contribution. And Dr. Mararike, in just about a minute or less, please make your contribution. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Joy, for uh, allowing me the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Professor Mtambara. Thanks. Uh, Tony, Amanda, and uh, Jana for the speech. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a couple points that uh, Tony, Amanda had mentioned. Uh, firstly, um, demystifying the constitution in order to involve our youths is very important in the sense that we have to educate from the bottom up. So once the youth and the general public understand the constitutionality of the process, then we can be able to go through and be able to have a dialogue. As it is now, listening to Professor Mtambara's presentation, it is very clear that we are talking uh, party politics. We are talking ZANU-PF, we are talking opposition. And once we start at that level, then we have problems in debating uh, issues that will bring us to a resolution. The other point that I wanted to touch about was uh, in terms of the amendment itself, the idea of a running mate. So the idea of a running mate might appear 
uh, attractive, but at the end of it, or even the way that we run our elections now, the president or whoever is uh, elected, then will appoint their vice, who will be the vice president of the country. In those countries that have running mates, the same thing happens in the sense that they would have already appointed that person anyway. And lastly, uh, Attorney Amanda mentioned a very important part about the constitution being, I want to describe it as a, a, a carnivorous, uh, it will eat itself. So it's there to be amended. So whether it comes seven years after 2013 or years later, to me, it's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is we are looking at the issues that would have to be uh, amended at that time. Uh, and lastly, let's take, for example, the United States of America. I don't know why I'm using that example, but I will anyway. They are running on a constitution that was written in 1776. And that is one of the problems that they are engaging in with regards to issues like gun control. So I am saying that, yes, constitutions can be and should be amended. I support a consultative approach. Thank you, Chair, and thanks all the speakers. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mararike. And at this point, I, I, I can see hands there, so please don't worry, we'll come back to you. Let's allow the uh, panel to, to respond. So as we prepare for your responses, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Mtambara, uh, coming in first as you unmute, just one comment here from uh, one of the participants, Darlington Chidarara, who says, unfortunately, our first set of amendments are not the ones that promote the true spirit and principles of constitutionalism. We created a fiction of a constitutional democracy and reverted, revered back to parliamentary democracy. This is uncalled for. The constitution must be respected and its amendment is different to, to other acts of parliament. So thank you there to Darlington for that uh, reflection and uh, any of the panelists who want to reflect on that too are free to do so. So Professor Mtambara, quickly to, you would not be able to respond to every item, but those that you would want to respond to so minutes, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think most of the comments were educational, you know, we're all learning from the comments, we're all benefiting from the comments. So I won't address everything, uh, but take it as uh, wisdom. Now, Jana and others, there are definitely good things in the bill. Let me articulate good things. The women's quota, the youth quota, the idea of moving the number of ministers from five to seven, potentially, potentially good things. Yeah. Now, the one that I want us to really think carefully about is the issue on devolution. Listen, I, I agree that women's quota, youth quota, ministers, okay. The devolution, go into the details. The only thing that we can debate is the issue of MPs. Is it a good idea to have MPs or not? The rest of the provisions are very sinister. They are very deceitful. They are not good for devolution at all. And I invite members to go and look at the provisions from chapter 14, which we put in in 2013, which were never implemented. And right now, nobody in this forum today has explained to me why ZANU-PF has not implemented those in eight years. And if you have not implemented them, why would, you, why, 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 why would your motive be positive now on devolution when you've not done what you're supposed to do in eight years? And so, I think let's have a healthy debate on the devolution uh, changes. The MPs, one could argue either way, but one could also say by having MPs being part of the, of, of the provincial government, you strengthen that center so that it, is, it has got the capacity of MPs and so on. But one could argue you blot it up, but I think there are pros and cons. But the other provisions where you're changing the chairmanship, where you're changing the, um, the number, you're putting more votes and so on. So Jana and others, I'm not convinced that the changes around devolution are positive. I'm very clear, the change on women, the change on youth, 
the change of the ministers potentially can be positive. However, I'm saying, why give me a poison chalice? Why you camouflaging evil deeds with good deeds? Separate them out. If you want to give me the youth, the women and the minister, do it separately. Don't put your evil agenda among good things. And let's reject this and then come back with only good things. So I wanted to just comment on, on, on that one. Now, uh, are we do party and so are we too Zanubia? You know, you know, I'll be very dishonest. If I was to come here and be a political and give an intellectual discussion and leave out Zanupier. And yet you know it is Zanupier MPs who are doing this. And yet you know that the ones abusing the two things. And yet you know that the ones destroying the opposition, buying opposition, creating the opposition. So I I I am a soldier. I'm a political soldier. I'm not your intellectual, nice little Oxford guy. No, because I know there's a problem which is political here. So I'll be dishonest if I was to come here and not tell you that there's a sinister agenda to create an imperial presidency around Bunangagwa by ZANU PF. I'll be dishonest if I don't tell you that ZANU PF is abusing his two thirds majority. I know you'd want to be apolitical and have a discussion without opposition. Zanupiev, I can't do that. I have to give you the sense of what is going on. And by the way, the coup, very important, Dr. Zamchia, you know, we're in the context of a coup d'etat. But guess what? What we're doing now will lead to another coup d'etat. You know why? Why did the first one happen? Mugabe had these useless vice presidents. He was firing and hiring at will. And one of them left the country and engineered the coup d'etat. So what Munangakwa is doing could lead for a coup d'etat by somebody else. Because right now he's controlling succession. He's controlling everything. And maybe some people will say the only answer is a coup d'etat. So yes, we are within the context of a coup d'etat. But if we are not careful, these shenanigans will lead to another coup d'etat. The NCA, very good point. You know what? We need the NCA today. We need civic society today. You know why? Because in some of these issues, you find that ZANU-PF and the opposition are together. For example, running mates. If you are to be very sincere and ask your friends from the MDC Alliance, what the views are on the, 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 the running mates, you'll find that some of them don't mind it being removed. They would rather have useless VPs. They would rather control succession, just like Changrai. I was with Changrai and Mugabe. Changrai and Mugabe were very happy to set aside the running mates. Changrai wanted no succession in the MDC. Mugabe wanted no succession in Zanopia. So an NCA or civic society can come in and say, no, we want the running mate because it's good for the country. No, we want this because it's good for the country. You can't leave it to political parties. Now that we're in a constitutional crisis mode, the NCA, not this party led by Maduku, the original NCA has become even more important. Civic society has become even more important because you, a civic society, can come in and say, we are speaking for the people. We have no political ambitions. We are neither opposition. We're neither ZANU PF. And so the case is very strong now for civil society and also for a group like the NCA, the original one, not this current political party called NCA. Young people, young peoples are leaders of today. Reject the notion that says young people are leaders of tomorrow. So young people must be engaged, young people must be involved, but don't wait to be invited. Don't say, how do we bring young people to the table? Young people create your own table. Young people invent the table. Young people create history. Don't wait to be invited. Take charge. Be masters of your own destiny as young people. Litigation, creative litigation, I've already proposed that. Let us have creative litigation around amendment number one, creative litigation around amendment number two, or oh, I've already suggested several things to do, political, legal, civic society, and also mobilizing to make sure there are no further changes. Tomorrow, 
they will change the constitution to increase the age limit for the president. Tomorrow, they will change the constitution to remove term limits for the president. If they could do it with this amendment one and two, what will stop them for the future? You and I have to mobilize. You and I have to stand up to power and be able to say no to any further mutilation and destruction of our constitution. Lives versus constitutionalism. You know, people think that we're being academic, like constitutionalism, constitutionality, democracy. Constitutionalism is about bread and butter issues. It's about lives, about jobs, about the economy. If you mess up democracy, if you mess up constitutionalism, your economy won't perform. There will be no jobs. There will be no economy. There will be no lives. So the fundamentals of democracy, the fundamentals of constitutionalism are important for lives, are important for jobs, are important for food. So we are not being academic. We're not, we are dealing with lives. We're dealing with food. We're dealing with jobs. So let us make sure that we understand that. And um, running mate, Dr. Mararike, you're missing the points. When you have a running mate and going to an election, number one, the running mate is now an election issue. If you, put a, if, you, if you put a dummy, unelectable VP, you lose the elections. So before you go to an election, you have to think very carefully, who do I make my vice president or vice president? Because the people will be saying, we are judging you on yourself and your two women or two guys or one person, whatever. In other words, when the vice president is part of an election, it's different from when they are picked up <clears> after <throat> an election. Obama and Biden, Biden and Kamala. You know you're voting for Obama and Biden. You're not just voting for Obama. You know who's going to succeed if Obama dies, Biden takes over. So when you vote, you're voting for succession. You're voting with clarity on succession. So where you have a running mate is different from where a VP is picked after the election. But more importantly, you bring certainty to succession. Mutarika died in Malawi. Joyce Banda took over. They tried to stop it. They couldn't, which was a running mate. Magufuli died, and the lady took over. Hassan took over. No problem. In Zimbabwe, Mamujuru was VP for 14 years. She was discarded by Robert Mugabe, like she didn't matter at all. She was used and abused. <clears throat> Kupe was a VP for Changrai. When Changrai thought he was going to disappear, he appointed two other people ahead of Kupe. She was abused and used. If Kupe was a running mate to Changrai in 2013, there was no way she could be undermined. We must protect these women who are being abused, by the way, or men who are being abused. A running mate brings certainty and clarity to succession within parties, clarity to succession within the country. Also, it makes sure that we have at least two elected people, three elected people. Now, the problem with these guys who don't want a running mate, they want power in one individual. Not only them, them and their psychophants, them and their clansmen, them and their tribesmen, them and their bootlickers. We can don't I... want bootlickers in the political parties. We don't want bootlickers yes, in government. We want to make sure that um, you have a bona fide VP or VPs that uh, can be elected, that can take over from you. So there is a clear difference between a VP who is appointed after elections and a VP who goes through an election as a running mate. I think can, you I, can I hold you questions. there, Prof? Can I hold you there? I know you had one or two other points to make. Let me just hold you there and ask Jana and Amanda to come through and then write it completely. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Great. Thank you so much, Prof. Jana, please come through. Thank you. I, I will only touch on two or three things. I think the prof has covered a lot, and I'm really grateful for the 
many comments and reflections participants are sharing this evening. So I'll start with the point uh, that Zamchia rightly makes that context matters. And um, for me, Zamchia, that's one of the reasons I talked about the issue of trust. It's precisely because of our context. We lack trust as a people, as a country. We don't trust um, Saki, we don't trust the rulers. They are ruling, they are not leading. Um, we, in any of the political entities, for most of us, for most of us, um, I, I'm not gonna, I, 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 of course, ignore the fact that uh, uh, there are a lot who do trust uh, the, the political uh, rulers um, uh, in these different uh, political parties. Um, uh, and, and for me, part of the issue around the context, when I, I don't know, I, I don't know what the drafters were thinking, what were the motives of ZANU-PF, but I, I really believe this process of excluding people was part of them wanting to play around with the context. Um, which has been really well talked into uh, by, by, by the prof. So yes, context matters. The things we see happen both in our politics, in our economy, in our everyday lives at home uh, are, are, are part of the context uh, that I feel has led to not wanting to engage the people. Um, if, if the people were happy and satisfied um, and feeling like they are being led well, I am sure they would have been consulted and engaged, um, but I, I, I feel there is a sense there. Um, on, on the issue of, 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 of rulers, civil society, you know, I, I always reflect, for me, one of my inspirations is, is something that uh, the late Kofi Annan said um, one month before he died. He was here in Zimbabwe. And, and there's something that I felt he said that's so powerful. He said, when the leaders fail to lead, let the people rise and lead. So if we want to talk about leadership personally, I am looking to civil society, and I'm glad that a crisis in coalition, 110 members in your organization and platform, where is leadership out of this quagmire that we are facing as a country? The political parties have shown us that they are not gonna do it. And as a people, we can trust for sure it's not gonna happen. So the leadership we are looking for, Saki, is not gonna be found in the political parties. It's gonna be found in you. You are the leaders we are looking for. You are the leaders that we are waiting for. And um, uh, 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 when you look for me uh, at this constitutional amendment, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, we are going forward. We're going forward as a country based on the past. We're not even couching your future. All these things we are talking about are things that have happened continually and continually. So you are looking at a, 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 a leadership or a rulership uh, or parties that are seeking to just do things for a legal framework. Because the constitution, the spirit of the constitution, as one of the participants put in the chat room, has not been taken into consideration here. It's about creating a legal framework so that you can say by law, this is what we have done. Again, where are the people? And then the last one I will touch on is the issue of quotas. Do quotas enhance gender equality? Is it just tokenizing women? Is it entrenching patriarchy? I'm not gonna argue with any of those things. I will say though why I think quotas are key and important. One of the things about quotas is gender quotas is they are about the society. They're not even about the quota itself. They're a reflection of the kind of society that we are, that we are a society that still does not respect women's leadership. I mean, look to the examples that uh, Professor Mtambara has just pointed out of the various political parties and how they have shamelessly treated women leaders within them. So left to ourselves as a people, we are not yet behaving aright, maturely and to our best interests. And so quotas become a right as women that we fight for to say we have to be there as women, regardless of our political opinions and differences and political parties and standing. 
So for me, I, I really feel that patriarchy is a reality. We continue to fight um, and um, enforcing quotas is a catalyst to check patriarchy, to recognize that exclusion of women is not right, is to help you as society begin to see what you know already, that women's leadership is good leadership for you as well, and that we need to balance um, who represents us uh, in this country and make sure that our representatives are a reflection of the total population in the country. I think that's what I'll say about that, Joy, and pass on to Amanda. Thank you so much, Jana. Amanda, let's have your responses. Okay, thank you for that. I'm also going to try and keep it quite brief. I want to respond um, directly to Samantha. I think it was who um, engaged me on what I said about the youth. I will be clear and say that my statement was a bit broad sweeping, but of course I am alive to, to the different factors that play, come into play when I say that the youth are despondent, the youth are not participating in these discussions. To me, it's a... Ah, Aquí pe jugando mi Madagascar. Pero ustedes qué van a saber con Chotumare? Ah, qué van a saber pues? Ah. Please, please mute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I meant is, I, I think. Caer, no? uh -oh. You can you can proceed, uh, Amanda Host. Please mute and eject. Okay, um, I, think it, I think it speaks to a level of despondency that comes from inconsistencies just like this um, amendment we're talking about. A lot of the commentary I'm seeing is to say, well, what's the point anyway? Um, people feel very excluded from this process to the extent that most people are inclined to step back from the conversation. People feel excluded also by um, someone picked up the, the inaccessible jargon and language that is used to the extent that, you know, a lot of people can't even tell you what are the amendments being made to the constitution because they are not quite um, engaged in the process and slowly we are deliberately excluding the voices of young people we are excluding the voices of just ordinary citizens who want to participate or who ought to participate in democracy but are now being left out when you have a whole process that was done for the 2013 um, constitution to come about uh, it, it, it almost feels like it's being taken lightly if we're going to do what seems to be an overnight amendment without the proper the proper procedural elements being followed. And I think this is what is making most of our youth just feel like there's no point. A lot of people are saying, well, what's the point of voting? I've heard that a lot from young people. You know, when you ask any teenager who's coming, are you going to vote? They, they'll laugh and say that this, is, this has nothing to do with me because um, very often, uh, these kind of moves just sort of depress us as people and make us feel like, you know, we're losing hope in having a, a true sense of a constitutional democracy. For me, myself as a lawyer, um, it's very alarming and frightening. You know, if you dedicate your entire life to a particular profession, certain things are supposed to work a certain way. The law out of all things is meant to be stable. Anyone shouldn't feel like something like the constitution can be changed easily. It can't be that easy to, to make changes. Before we even start talking about the substance of the changes, um, it shouldn't be just a matter of, you know, one side uh, being able to push its, its agenda on everybody to the extent that we have voices fizzling out to the extent that we only have politically charged debates, to the extent that um, now also responding to, to Prof's assertion to say that, well, it is a political thing. Uh, at the same time, I, I feel 
what it does is it excludes certain people from the conversation because once you polarize a debate in any way, um, we start to lose we start to lose the nuance of it. And I think this is what I was trying to say, to say that once you, you associate the word parliament with the ZANU PF, mm -hmm. um, you are now particularizing these things and making them based on individuals. And this is why the culture will never change if we aren't able to sometimes step out of those names, step out of those individuals and say, but what are the broader principles that we are trying to protect as a nation? And I think to me, this is what um, makes me a little bit sad, I guess, because uh, we are giving and taking, giving and taking and not really moving forward in a way that we can feel settled. Um, another question was asked to say, what, what am I doing or what can we do as young people? Sure, quickly on that one, Amanda very briefly what am i doing being here this is not my ideal <laughs> setup or or it's it's something actively out of my comfort zone because i understand that even just by being here i'm inviting a different audience to come and listen because they know me um i am talking a lot on youtube uh in order to to try and make the constitution more accessible um, so I have a YouTube channel, it's called Amanda and Vanille, where I've tried to make, you know, to sort of lighten up certain issues, but with the underlying drive of education being the heart of it. So I think that's, this is what I just want to get at as my last point to say that education, understanding of the constitution and its principles is where we need to start for us to take these conversations to the next level, for us to then be able to take actionable steps, for us to, to have smart litigation as was raised by people. And yeah, I think that would be my response. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everybody's participation. It's been um, at least a bit of an encouraging debate to see that we are, we are moving in terms of the way we're speaking about these things. So thank you. Thank you, Joy. I will stop now. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Amanda. And also thanks for taking the opportunity to uh, pass your concluding remarks. So participants, we are about to get to the closure of this, uh, this meeting. We don't want to hold you longer than is necessary. And there are key issues that are coming up here. And uh, let me just read one of the comments and uh, Perhaps questions here, David Malunga says, my thinking is this, this view was supposed to be split devolution on its own judges, on its own youth and women's quota, on its own, we're supposed to have four views. And um, uh, somebody says, uh, this is 3.30 iPad, we should have, uh, we should always have more of these weekly crises, even districts must have this. Thank you for that. Um, there are so many other comments really that I won't be able to read through. But let me also, just recognize one final input from um, uh, Honorable Job Scala, who had his hand up that before you unmute Honorable Scala, I also just wish to recognize um, uh, amongst the participants, Dr. Nkosana Moyo, a politician. Thank you so much, Honorable Scala, yourself. Uh, Eva Joyce Wynn, who was also part of the constitutional movement and is well known for her contributions to the women's movement in Zimbabwe, and of course, is a uh, She's a global icon in her own right. Uh, we have Reverend Usaini Svanda, who has also been part of the Crisis in Zim Coalition uh, leadership. I recognize you, Grace Ruimbo Chirenje, um, Koma Oswo, Bima, uh, Brej Malava, and of course, friends of the struggle, Hugo and Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Honorable Scala, just your quick contributions here before we hand over back to uh, the panel for one minute conclusion. Honorable Stella, if you can unmute and make your contribution, please. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Facilitator. I think you, you, you can go ahead with other uh, participants so that we, we can get as much views as possible because I also have got the, the same debate with this Yambe Zyambe on, um, on television two, two days coming. So let me reserve my uh, my comments at the moment and allow others to contribute so that I will also learn from them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Scala. It's also good that our platforms attract, um, uh, you know, politicians like yourselves, politicians like uh, Dr. Ngosana Moyo and many other civic um, 
activists, uh, Bob Mchabaiwa, I recognize you here and these that I've mentioned. Uh, colleagues, it may be time for us to pull the strings together and be able to conclude. For those that were not able to jump on to this Zoom call, I trust you've been following on our Facebook page, that is the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition's Facebook page where this is being run live. Uh, before I hand over to the chairperson of the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, let me just make a few observations from this conversation that really I get a sense that uh, the bulk of participants are really, uh, participants as well as uh, the panel are really not happy with uh, uh, what some may call the mutilation of the constitution soon enough before really people have lived the constitution. It's not, it has not even been, uh, some of the pieces of legislation have, are yet to be aligned to the new constitution. Many people would have thought that the spirit of um, togetherness and nation, nation building would have continued to be uh, what informs any amendments if necessary. And I do take note, Professor um, Tambara, of your way forward around the need for a broad um, classes of strategic counteraction and the need for political mobilization, the need for pushing back against uh, entrenched authority, authoritarianism. Of course, the need to look deeper into the amendments in case there are one or two things that might be good for Zimbabweans. Perhaps uh, these things are hidden in good things, who knows, but uh, it's up to Zimbabweans to determine what they would want to do. So in uh, a minute or two, Professor Mtambara, your parting shot, please. Um, just to emphasize that constitutionalism is about the behavior, the tradition, the culture of respecting the constitution. It is about the spirit of the constitution. And also remember constitutionality being in accordance to the law is a very low level requirement. A dictatorship can actually satisfy constitutionality. Why? Because they can create laws that oppress people. And then they say, we are observing our constitution. Hitler observed constitutionality, but he did not have constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is about values. It's about limited government. It's about putting limits on the power of one individual. It's about removing autocracy. So we must understand that constitutionalism is about values. It's about a culture. It's also about limited governance. It's about functional separation of powers. Now, what we're doing in amendment number two is to remove the functional separation of powers. We are creating illegal judges. We are creating a blind judiciary. We are creating a compromised judiciary. Also, we are being obsessed with politics and not the economy. Our uh, people have no jobs. We are under COVID. Why are we doing this? Why are we even talking constitution and amendments when we have no food, when we have no jobs, when we are dying from COVID? Where are our priorities as leaders? This is shameful. Another thing is civic education, very important. Somehow, some way, we lost an opportunity to create a constitutional commission for civic education. We proposed it, but somehow it got lost during COPAC, where this commission will be in charge of educating the people about the constitution, about governance. A constitutional commission for civic education was lost. Four bills. Thank you so very much. You make my point. If these guys were serious about quotas, serious about devolution, they'd have a bill for devolution on its own, a bill for quotas on its own, a bill for running mates on its own, so that we can reject what we don't want. But they're being deceitful. They're being criminal in their approach. And I'm sorry, I have to call them out. They are deceitful. That's why they're putting poison within good food. And they say, it, it's good for you. It's not good for me. Take out the poison or I reject the entire food. Going forward, no one is going to come and save us. We are going to be the change we seek to see in Zimbabwe. Do not leave it to political parties. They've got too many vested interests. We must 
approach the Zimbabwean people in general, civic society in general, the churches, the workers, the students, the young people, beyond the political parties. Yes, the parties have a role to play, but you and I, ordinary people, must become the change they seek to see in Zimbabwe. You and I have an agenda, have a debt to Zimbabwe. We must step up to the plate and be counted. Our future is in our hands. I thank you so very much for this opportunity to share with your people. I thank you very much, Joy. I thank you very much, a crisis in Zimbabwe. The struggle continues unabated. Thank you so much, Prof. That's loud and clear. Jana, your last word, please. Very shortly, uh, Joy, to encourage us in civil society to go back to the people. Let's go back to the people. Let's uh, connect again, I will say, with the people of this country. Um, what we saw in the early 2000s was a civil society leading the agenda of the nation by forcing the constitutional debate governance table. That's what we saw. Um, when, by the time President Mugabe was setting up his constitutional commission, it was in reaction to the work that was being done by the National Constitutional Assembly and because it had penetrated every corner of this country and everywhere any politician went, people were asking for and talking about the constitution. And so perhaps it's poignant that we have come back together again as a nation to have a conversation on this one thing, which like I said earlier on, is not just about us today, but is something that even is important for those who will live even beyond the, my children's it's, 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 it's lifetime. So civil society leaders, let's drive the agenda of the nation with people right at the center, at the front, and all around that agenda. Thank you. Thank you so and much. Joy, Joy, sorry, Joy. I just wanted to say yes, that I'll be doing an article yes. that explains in detail what I've been speaking about. Because sometimes when we talk, we don't get all the ideas out. So I'll be putting a document out which people must respond to challenge and critique, but I'll be doing a document. Thank you so much, Prof. I'm sure many of us will be waiting for that one. Thank you so much. And thanks, Jana, also for that loud and clear message. Let's have thought leadership from our civil society. Let's have agenda setting. Let's have convening such as what, uh, what crisis is doing at the moment. But more importantly, uh, civil society must reconnect with the masses, must reconnect with the people and uh, be able to collectively drive the agenda. It wouldn't have been said any better. So thanks for that, Jana. Uh, Amanda, I believe you had uh, done your parting shots. So thanks a lot for this. Really, uh, mine was just to facilitate this conversation. And I believe I've done so. Uh, I do not need to pull the strings together. We were doing this as we were conversing. So thank you so much, Prof, for this input. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, Amanda. But let me do at this point hand over the meeting to the chairperson of the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, Rashid Mahia, to give the vote of thanks and of course to the meeting. So over to you, Rashid, and thanks to you, uh, the panelists and uh, the participants. Thanks and over, Rashid. Uh, thank you, uh, Joy, for the wonderful uh, facilitation. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Professor Mtambara, Amanda, and uh, Comrade Jana for the lively, incisive, informative, and even provocative um, contributions that uh, have lightened uh, this conversation and have brought uh, new dimensions to the amendment that has taken place. Thank you for the encouragement and the advice to civil society, Jana. We need to go back to the people to connect with the people so that we speak, not for the people, but also we speak for ourselves and let the, the people that are affected speak for themselves so that the constitution becomes a living document
that uh, connects and relates to the citizens and they can relate to it in terms of um, their livelihood. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for representing the young people. And we appreciate the fact that we need new voices. We, uh, we have had enough voices in the main. It's good to hear new voices and to appreciate that there are people that are doing a lot of work outside the normal defined traditional civil society spaces. We have gone to the communities as broader civil society when there was a public uh, outreach by the parliamentary committee. And the report by parliament was very clear that the citizens rejected amendment number two because we had engaged with communities. So for every public hearing that took place, civil society had engaged with people, mobilized people to be part of that, and they rejected it. But anyway, regardless of that uh, effort, the amendment found its way into parliament and has been passed today. So we appreciate and accept the responsibility of civil society to continue engaging and working. And we see the value in creating such platforms as this platform to continue the debate and the discussion. We realize that uh, it is a long journey, it's not a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. There are setbacks that we have faced, and we need to continue soldiering on. As Professor Mtambara said, the struggle continues, and we expect and promise to continuously execute that struggle in ensuring that citizens are informed. But not only informed, but we're also informed of the needs and expectations of the citizens so that they speak for themselves. So thank you for coming to this platform. The Crisis Global Coalition is your platform of choice. We'll continue to host these uh, platforms for us to have this debate. The constitution needs to be protected from this dictatorship, from this autocracy, because we will see and experience more uh, amendments to the constitution. So we have a responsibility to continuously inform each other, create platforms for engagement. And thank you for your lively debate. Uh, thank you very much. May you all uh, drive safely wherever you are or stay at home as safely as you can. Thank you to our colleagues at, at, at the crisis that are working so hard and all civil society players. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Amanda. Thank, thank you, everyone. You, thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. We need more of this. I'm, I'm we we yeah. need this more. Make sure you do more every week. Please. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's the only time. Bro, bro, it's the only time uh, that we. When I'm going back to be frontline, so. Thank you, bro. <laughs> thank you, Jana. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Thank you, bro. 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 Thank you, Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Thank you, bro. 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 I like your, your yeah. calmness. Joe Ima Beng, you are the man. Keep it up, wow. brother. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you, sir. Let us all come to the ground, guys. For job scholars, let's mobilize the rural. For job scholars, let's mobilize the rural. Thank you, Amanda. Definitely. I, I love the fact that the meeting is actually continuing. Is people <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for Joe No, is on ice today. <laughs> <laughs> keep it up, guys. Keep it up. Keep it up. Where's Thank you so much. Yeah, we need, we need Mr. Kila around. But I Politics in Zimbabwe is that far from one. But we need to do something about it, guys. This is the perfect We have to do something. Yeah, hey. Moshe, where are you? I miss you. Yeah, but, but guys, we need to do something about the NCA. We need hey. to do another, to form another organization on the NCA. <laughs> where yes, are you? That's true. I agree. Sorry. <laughs>
the the MC are mutated into a, an opposition party now. They found yes. an opportunity.